All right, so um, thank you very much, Trudeau. Very much appreciate the opportunity to present to this group and thank you all for your interest. And as well, Derek Smith, I appreciate you as well attending and um, helping with the commentary afterwards. I'm going to go through briefly just this presenter disclosure. It's not a conflict of interest disclosure per se, because I don't have any financial or other conflicts. But because we're talking about policy issues, I think issues of disclosure of rules is important. In that context, these are many of the different areas I've been involved in. Trudeau had mentioned a number of them. One additional one, which I will mention, is uh, my role as physician chair of Humber River Hospital, uh, of the physician uh, chair of the MAID team at my hospital. And I do want to point out, I'm not a conscientious objector. I've actually been involved in MAID since the beginning. However, I have come to become very concerned about the risks of expansion to particular populations. And I think that'll become apparent through the rest of my talk. I'm gonna whip through some of these early slides. I'm sure that everyone here has a solid background, but just as a reminder, um, the initial court ruling from 2015 that led to the requirement to change our laws on assisted dying stems from the 2015 court ruling involving Kay Carter and Gloria Taylor. Gloria Taylor had ALS, Kay Carter had spinal stenosis. And as you know, the court ruled unanimously that the then blanket prohibition against assisted dying violated our charter. Moving forward from that, we got Bill C-14, and that was in 2016 that it came in place. And I'm not going to dwell on that other than a little bit of the clinical piece here, which is how a illness was deemed to be grievous and irremediable. And this is important because it's still relevant today, even with our new legislation, at least the first three items are. And, you know, the first two, relatively self-evident what it means, serious and incurable or advanced and, sorry, advanced state of irreversible decline. The C I've put in parenthesis because it is important to note that we are the only jurisdiction in the world that actually has this qualified criteria, which says that intolerable suffering can't be relieved under conditions that they, as in the person, the patient, subjectively finds acceptable. There is no requirement of no prospect of improvement. There is no requirement of medical futility, nor of the physician or the care team and patient jointly having no conviction that other reasonable solutions are not uh, viable. And that is different from any other place in the world. Even in the Benelux countries, they have requirements like that. And then the last one, as you know, about reasonably foreseeable death, that one has now been dropped as a result of the Truchon case. Um, I won't go over the Truchon case in any detail. I'm going to limit most of my comments to the clinical pieces rather than the legal ones. But I will point out a couple of things. And uh, the, the main thing is that, keep in mind, none of these rulings involved mental illness. Yes, in the first Supreme Court ruling, they spoke of psychological suffering, but they did not speak specifically of mental illness, nor was mental illness before the courts in any of these cases. So where are we now? Well, after March 2021 uh, and the passage of C7, these are the key changes. As you know, elimination of the reasonably foreseeable natural death criterion or safeguard, and we now have two pathways. We've eliminated the 10-day waiting period that used to be there if death is reasonably foreseeable, and if death is not reasonably foreseeable, there's now a 90-day waiting period, which can be shortened under specific clinical circumstances. Made for sole mental illness will be uh, allowed by March 2023. That's by virtue of the sunset clause that was passed. There is now waiver of final consent, but that's not to be confused with advanced directives. It's not the same thing. And again, as a reminder, unique to Canada, no requirement for treatment. So what have we seen under the uh, MAID regime so far? Now, keep in mind, all of these stats are based on the old regime. This is all under C14, not C7. And it captures data for um, the uh, made cases up until end of 2020. And there is typically a six to eight month lag in the data being reported. So this is the latest data we have. And when you look at the numbers, what you see is that at this point, there, um, the, the numbers have been steadily increasing, both in absolute counts and also percentage death counts. So at this point, there are, um, it's approximately two and a half percent of all deaths in Canada are attributable to MAID. And even in this context, I think 
it's important to note. This slide is from 2019. I'll, I'll show, tell you why I'm showing that initially in a moment. But it's important to note that that percentage has been regularly increasing year over year. So 2020 saw a 34% growth in death rate from MAID compared to 2019. In 2019, the total deaths were 2% of all deaths. 2019 itself saw a 26% increase over 2018. And when you look at each jurisdiction, each province, without exception, every single province has had uh, growth in number of MAID cases and percentage of total deaths from 2019 to 2020. So this slide here shows you 2019, and you see that BC in the middle is at 2.4%, sorry, Quebec in the middle is at 2.4%, BC on the right is at 3.3% of all deaths. So there's variation within the provinces. There's a hint of a slide at the back, and that's the 2020 stats that I'm going to show you. And the reason it looks a bit odd is because they actually had to change the scale on the 2020 because it exceeded what was shown on the axis in the 2019. So when I flip to the next one, it's actually to the same scale. And you'll see that the numbers in each province have gone up, as has the red bar. The red bar is at 2% of all deaths. Now in 2020, red bar is at 2.5% of all deaths. And you see where the numbers are that uh, PEI is now at actually 2.6, Quebec 3.1, and BC is at 4%. This uh, is something of note. You know, when we look internationally, it tends to hover around 4% in Netherlands, about 2% or so in Belgium. Oregon is less than half a percent. And, and so this is before MAID expansion. And for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about MAID expansion. You know, I, this often inspires passionate debate. People have strong views on all sides. And I think that advocates on all sides likely come at issues with the best of intentions. I know I did. And I actually recall that a few years back at the time that I was uh, CPA president and led the time-limited CPA task force on MAID at one of our national conferences. Actually, Dr. Smith, I remember meeting you afterwards and you came and congratulated me for the balanced presentation that we had. And I do think that people come in with good intentions, but as we know, uh, paving a road with good intentions um, is not enough. And we can't pave roads with either misguided hope or fantasies. We need, in my opinion, to set our social policies to be informed by the best available evidence, not to be implemented while ignoring the best evidence. And you'll see why I've come to have a rather harsh conclusion about how we've come to be where we are, because I actually would describe it more as, um, and this is despite not being a conscientious objector, and this is despite seeing the value that MAID can bring in appropriate situations, but I do believe that our path to expansion of MAID has been more like this yellow broken road, paved with myths and failures of due diligence. And the rest of the talk, I will be explaining why I believe that. I'm gonna walk through many of these myths. These have become, in my opinion, quite pervasive. There are half a dozen that I'll go over. And I believe they have unfortunately falsely guided our public discourse, especially when you compare them to what evidence actually shows. So what's the first one? That mental illness is the same as other illnesses for the purposes of MAID. And this is very interesting because obviously we don't want to discriminate. You know, most of my career has been fighting against stigma and discrimination on behalf of and for those and with those with mental illness. However, that doesn't mean everything is the same. That just as the risks to someone with severe lung disease at high altitude are not the same as the risks to someone with arthritis at high altitude, when we are talking about issues of death, which are legitimate illnesses. They are not the same on the issues related to death, especially when we're talking about risks. And I'm gonna walk through some of those differences now. Again, I, I'm gonna limit my comments on the legal stuff quite a bit, but there are a few things that I'll point out. Um, this is one of them that you'll recall that the challenge to uh, in, in the first Supreme Court case was found to violate the charter on all three life, liberty, and security. And on the life one in particular, the idea that if someone has to be put in a situation of taking their life before they otherwise would want to, if they can anticipate progressive decline and eventually a point of incapacity, and they take their life before they would want to, 
then that's an infringement upon their life. Well, how does that play out for mental illness? You know, mental illnesses can affect a lot of things, lead to a lot of suffering, lead to sometimes issue of competency, although usually people remain competent. They very rarely affect physical agency. So very rarely does a mental illness actually prevent someone from taking their life, unlike in the cases before uh, at least the first court. The issue of formal capacity, and this is important to point out, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about formal capacity. People often think that formal capacity is an adequate safeguard. What we need to consider is how mental illnesses can impact thought processes in the same person, even while they retain formal capacity. And I'll whip through this very quickly, but this clinical information is important. You know, we know that there are cognitive distortions that are common with things like depression, which is the most common thing people seek made for in the Benelux countries for mental illness. And there's a triad of distortions that come to a person's thinking compared to how they themselves would think when they didn't have the illness or symptoms. And it's summarized by, I am bad, the world is bad, and the future will be bad. And while we normally may have some emotional resilience dealing with stressors when we're in periods of depression or high anxiety, we lose that resilience and we break rather than bend. We selectively focus on the negative and often discount the positive and, and, Biologically, we see that even on functional scans, there are things that in fact show that people with depression may be hindered from thinking about or conceptualizing the future. Think about what that means, a change in hope, change in ability to visualize the future, and I am in a state of depression and thinking about whether I want to be here. Now, the other issue which is different for mental illnesses is this, suicidality. People can have suicidal thoughts for a number of reasons. There are no other illnesses other than mental illnesses that actually have suicidality as a core symptom of the potential illness. And so that is quite unique. And we'll talk more about suicidality later. But just think about all the potential impacts that this can have on somebody's cognitive processing while they remain capable. And what could be different if they were different a year later in terms of remediability. So this is a bit of an entry to say that that first myth, I don't believe, is actually valid. Mental illness is not the same with respect to key issues related to death and MAID, and that leads to, to other things that also show it, but that starts to give you an example. Now, unfortunately, with these myths, what we'll often see is it's kind of like the Hydra from Greek mythology, that you address or you know chop off one head and more grow back. So... There are other myths that are quite similar to that first one. And here's another very key one for our framework, which is made for mental illness would be relief, providing relief of an irremediable condition. Why do I say that's a myth? Well, number one, what are we talking about when we talk about remediability versus irremediability? You know, clinically, every psychiatrist I know has been trained to go into the room and say, how can I help in the different areas, biologically, also with your social suffering, et cetera. We have no standards whatsoever to actually say when a situation is irremediable. Those standards don't exist. And later on, I'm going to talk a bit about how evidence suggests at this point, we can't even make those predictions. But the other piece is what are we deeming to be irremediable? You know, mental illnesses more common than other illnesses are co-associated with all sorts of psychosocial suffering. So are we talking about the suffering from the psychosocial factors or what? Now, one of the advantages of these Zoom talks, it's nice to meet in person, but one of the advantages of these virtual talks is that you can actually provide references. People can do their screenshots or see it afterwards. So I don't have to speak too much on it, but this was something that actually speaks to some of the issues of what irremediability actually means in, um, in mental illnesses. I, I won't speak to it, but again, you have the references, but I will speak briefly about the CCA report. I sat on that panel, Trudeau was on one of the CCA panels as well. And, you know, after a year and a half, nearly a year and a half, 250 page report, 25 key findings, the most interesting things that came out of it were that we still had five highlighted areas of disagreement on fundamental issues. And suicidality was one of those. Now, in terms of, I'm calling this the old days, you'll see why in a bit, but in the, in the old days, when these things were first unfolding, uh, when I was CPA president at that time, the CPA, Canadian Psychiatric Association, actually came out and acknowledged what we don't know, which is there are no established standards of care anywhere 
for defining the threshold when psychiatric conditions should be considered irremediable. CAMH, completely neutral party. They're not political. Specifically on policy advice on MAID has said that there is simply not enough evidence available for clinicians to ascertain whether a particular individual has an irremediable mental illness. There is a difference between someone might be in an irremediable situation and whether we can predict that. MAID requires that we can predict that. CAMH clearly has reviewed the evidence and said, no, we can't. And there are other groups, uh, Trudeau and I were both on this, the expert advisory group. Again, I won't speak to it, but this reviewed the evidence. This is the reference that went out to you already. But I will point out that many other associations based on these same concerns have weighed in, psychiatric associations saying that MAID should not be provided for non-terminal or mental illness, including the American Psychiatric Association and the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. It's interesting that when you look at even at groups that um, advocate for MAID for mental illness, like the Quebec Psychiatric Association, AMPQ, they acknowledge that irremediability, regarding irremediability, that it is possible that a person who has recourse to MAID, regardless of his condition, could have regained the desire to live at some point in the future. And they're suggesting that regarding irremediability, assessors will have to answer this ethical question each and every time they evaluate a request. I will remind you that in terms of our MAID framework, what the public has been told, what our debate has been, what the public has been promised is that MAID is for irremediable conditions. They've not been promised that an irremediable be condition will be determined if someone has a serious and incurable illness in the ethical opinion of each assessor, or if they're in an advanced state of irreversible decline in capacity in the ethical opinion of each and every assessor. And this is one of the uh, logic flaws that permeates this debate, that you can't pretend that we're determining irremediability in mental illnesses when we can't. Even the groups that are advocating for expansion acknowledge that we can't. And this was repeated even in Senate testimony, the AMPQ president, when specifically asked about the lack of evidence and scientific methods said, it's not a data different question, this is an ethical question. Well, mood um, expert and suicidologist, Dr. Mark Sinier from Sunnybrook wrote an opinion piece on that and essentially described that as nonsensical gibberish. We don't base medical decisions that are supposed to be scientific just on only on ethical decisions. That's a different framework. So that is a myth that mental illness would be for irremediable conditions. It would not be for irremediable conditions. But of course, another head grows. Expanded made, expanded made is not suicide. And this is key here because when we look at what I would call our previous made, which was for reasonably foreseeable death, there we do see differences that can be pulled out between people who are traditionally suicidal and people receiving MAID when they are dying. However, expanded MAID is not the same thing. You know, we coined this term, Canada coined this term, medical assistance in dying, when policy was introduced to help someone compassionately die and avoid suffering when death was foreseeable. That was medical assistance in dying. Is it the same thing when we are providing death to someone who is not dying, but wishes to die, who literally has a wish for suicide? That is what the word means. Now, if you listen to the evidence, it's not the same thing. And in the CCA review, what we found is that while it, for terminal conditions, you can tell the differences even between motivation for death, et cetera, and tell that apart from traditional suicidality, you cannot do that for psychiatric euthanasia. When you look at the people who are applying for psychiatric euthanasia, you have overlapping characteristics, including ambivalence, demoralization, ruminative, depressive despair, et cetera. And of course, the issue of the concurrent psychosocial suffering. What is death being provided for if it's not for an irremediable illness? So, you know, in terms of some of the language, I would also issue a caution. We talk about MAID and say that, well, even when we expand it, it's not suicide. It, it's assisted suicide when we expand it. There's no question. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad, but that is accurate. And 
the problem becomes when we refuse to even say that word. You know, we've got reporting guidelines for the media when discussing suicide. It includes things like not glorifying it, not romanticizing it. Think about some of the discussions that you must have heard regarding made expansion. So anyways, there goes another head. That expanded made is not suicide. Well, expanded made, expanded made is assisted suicide, and that should be honestly acknowledged. Now, what about this one? This is a big one, and I'm going to spend probably about five minutes on this one alone. Due diligence has been done. We always hope for that. Look, this, is, this thing has gone through various committees. It has gone through parliamentary procedures, and we have laws on this. Of course, due diligence for a country must have been done. Well, let's see if that's actually the case. Look, let's look at what has not happened. So again, reminder, the five mandated five-year reviews were bypassed. The lower Quebec court ruling was unusually not appealed. And instead, what happened was, as you know, it went to the Senate that recommended this sunset clause. And, you know, no, imagine an antidepressant. Imagine a pharmaceutical company saying, approve my medication in 18 months. And in that time, I will show you that it works and I will show you that it is safe. It doesn't happen. That's not how medicine and science is supposed to work. We don't know a presupposed outcome until we actually explore the evidence. So anyways, what else happened? Well, after one year with made for mental illness excluded from C7, which Minister Lametti repeatedly assured would be a safeguard that C7 would not include mental illness, well, on February 23rd of this year, the government decided they would add the sunset clause to ensure that made for mental illness was allowed in two years, uh, not whether, but how. And less than three weeks later, March 17th, parliament votes to adopt. And you know, even that debate is interesting. There were comments made by the parliamentary secretaries about hundreds of hours, if not thousands of debate and discussion that there's been scrutiny with 139 MPs speaking, 45 hours of debate. You know, that did not happen between February 23rd and March 17th. That was not about mental illness being added. So this debate that was being referenced did not deal with the mental illness issue. And there was confusion even within the governing party. Up to a week later, several MPs up to a federal minister, former federal minister, wrongly claimed in emails to constituents that made for mental illness was excluded from the bill that had passed and that they had voted for, when in fact the exact opposite had happened. They had voted to include made for mental illness. So what about the expert medical associations input? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, I had been president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association and for a two year period prior to 2020, there was no member consultation or input whatsoever or engagement. And then in March, 2020, the CPA came out with a statement saying that patients with psychiatric illness should not be discriminated against and should have available the same options regarding MAID as available to all patients. Quite remarkably, a few months later, they actually acknowledged and admitted that our statement was never intended to examine whether psychiatric conditions are irremediable. And if so, how this should be assessed. This is remarkable. This came about because of member concern about, well, you know, these things are supposed, made is supposed to be for irremediable conditions. How can you issue that other statement without having examined this? And they admitted they had not even examined it. What did they say? Well, between the Senate hearings and consultation process, CPA claimed that although it had officially no position, it repeatedly stated that the exclusion of mental illness is inaccurate and stigmatizing, vague and overbroad, discriminatory, unconstitutional etc. The links are there for you. And unfathomably, I still do not understand this. Throughout this entire consultation process on mental illness and death, the CPA never once raised the issue of mental illness related suicide risk, suicide prevention, they never even mentioned suicide. That would be like a respirology association on consultations on lung health, never mentioning smoking. It is, um, I, I have no explanation for it. And even worse, I would say that many of our experts medically have abdicated their role as expert. 
you know, a, a common theme is something like this. This is again, straight from the Senate testimony when the CPA president was asked, does the CPA agree with other experts that more research is needed in mental disorders prior to providing made for mental illness? Answer of the CPA president, I guess that is a legislative decision. We are supposed to be providing expert medical input so that legislators and policymakers can make decisions, not simply say, you make up your own minds. Now, unfortunately, this is a common theme, and I will flag this for you. Just listen to the arguments that are put forth by those who use their platform as medical experts to repeatedly defer to the courts or to say the courts have already decided this or the courts have decided that as a shield against actually providing evidence or anything beyond personal opinion supporting safe expansion. I doubt a day will go by listening to a debate on this topic without hearing that kind of refrain. Now, this has been criticized again by mood experts. I leave you a few um, references there in, in um, peer reviewed journals. Uh, one's an opinion piece, one's a peer reviewed journal. I had quite a sharp critique as well of the issue of evidence that in Canada's debate about medical assistance in dying, evidence has already been provided a medically assisted death. Now, other than the evidence, what are psychiatrists' opinions? That is important to know. Six months after adopting the controversial position statement on MAID without any member engagement, the CPA did a member survey which was criticized for being highly biased. And remarkably, even at that time and to this day, they have not asked members whether they agree with their position statement. The Ontario, um, med sorry, the Ontario Medical Association section on psychiatry, which is the largest, largest psychiatric body in the country, did a survey this summer. I sit on the executive and I helped along with the other executive in designing the survey. And of the about 300 validated responses, I'll just run through a little bit of the results here for you. But this is to point out that this is not a group of conscientious objectors. The vast majority of psychiatrists believe that MAID should be offered. It's 86%, I think, or whatever the number there is showing to only 11% thinking it should not be. But when you ask them, do you think made for mental illness should be permitted, it changes. And here the majority, 56%, do not agree with that to 28%. So by two to one margin, psychiatrists in Ontario do not agree with made for mental illness being provided. And if you go to the end of range responses of those who strongly disagree to those who strongly agree, it's even more, it's three to one. If you look at Essentially, this would reflect the CPA position statement of, do you agree with the position patients should have available the same options without issues of irremediability and mental illness having been examined? Again, strong disagreement with this. And this goes to about a three to one disagreement and the end of range response is four to one. When you actually ask, well, what about the sunset clause? Do you think that there should be further review to determine whether made for soul conditions should be allowed before committing to it in two years? The significant majority think there should be further review by a three to one margin and the end of range strongest responses are a five to one margin or yeah, five to one margin. And this is the last of the results I'll go through here, but this is a very interesting one. If patients in your practice requested made, would you personally be in favor of these patients receiving MAID. Only 12% of psychiatrists said that they would be in favor. That is less than half the number that actually on an aggregated basis agreed with MAID for mental illness. 28% agreed with MAID for mental illness. What this means is that less than half of even the psychiatrists who support MAID for mental illness actually see in their own practice patients they think should be able to get it. So last point on the due diligence, I'll just briefly mention this, but you'll remember that there was uh, prior Dr. to- Dr. Gain, another five minutes, please. Okay, thank you. I'll okay. skip through this then, but it's just an issue of, um, of standards and the idea that generally chart reviews should not be sufficient for things. The other ones are much quicker, the other myths. So due diligence, I do not believe has been done. Marginalized populations are not at risk. That's another myth. When you expand MAID, you see made, you see things affecting different populations. I'm going to skip through most of these first slides for time, but this is just to remind people that we don't all live in the same uh, boat. We don't all have the same things impacting us. So COVID disproportionately impacts people differently. 
Suicide rates impact different populations differently. So Aboriginal populations, uh, LGBTQ populations, et cetera, have higher suicide rates. And so obviously the concern here is that what suffering is leading to made requests? It's not just illness suffering, it's also life suffering. And especially when we can't say that something is irremediable, it's life suffering. And we find this. So you see disparities in death by MAID, that when MAID is provided for reasonably foreseeable death, it is more privileged people, better off, better educated who get it. When it's provided for psychiatric euthanasia, that's not true. It's people who lack socioeconomic resources. And concerningly, by a two to one margin, women to men receive psychiatric MAID, which parallels the ratio of suicide attempts that women to men make. So that is also a myth. Different populations are impacted differently. And then wrapping up the last myth, you know, in this um, myth of the Hydra, the last immortal head is the one that keeps coming back. And this, I think, is a huge one that expanded made is about autonomy. You know, it's about autonomy for some people, not for others. I will leave you this reference. I won't read it. This is a paper that came out recently in preprint. And it actually talks about the sorts of things that motivate made requests. This is not autonomy. Things about feeling a burden to society and um, other things. So I leave you the reference there. And I will also leave you this other reference, which came out this week in a podcast on Canada land, uh, quite literally about people who are applying made one in particular, who anticipates getting it when she runs out of money. This was not the stuff that was supposed to happen, but please have a look at that. And the British Medical Journal earlier this year, not on MAID, not on MAID, but on the impacts on different populations, they actually said that political attention to social determinants and inequities that exacerbate the pandemic could be deemed social murder. And in terms of, I'm just trying to flip through here, in terms of what we do see, the UN rapporteur on rights of persons with disabilities has had serious concerns about marginalized populations receiving made inappropriately. Um, as this is the piece I was saying from the medicalist journal, not specifically on made. And my view, again, you can look this up, but my view is that while expansion may be safe for the privileged who already live well and will have more autonomy to die better, for others, the non-dying disabled and marginalized we will eventually call it something else. So in conclusion, in five short years, we've gone from a made framework that was meant to provide compassionate relief from a painful death. It's expanded to one to provide assisted suicide for escaping a painful life. Um, medical assistance in dying to socially assisted death. And that could be a valid debate to have, but it is not the debate we have had. That is not what the made has been told to the population it's for. We now have the most liberal legislation in the world. The reason I say that is because of no requirement for treatment. And regardless of range of views on MAID, uh, I think it's unequivocal that evidence and due diligence have not informed the policy directions in Canada. And I will end there. I'll leave this up just for about five seconds for later if people want additional references. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll stop the screen share Trudeau. Thank you, Dr. Gaint. Uh, so I'll invite uh, Dr. Smith uh, to uh, present a commentary on the presentation by Dr. Gaint. We don't hear you, uh, Dr. Smith. You have to unmute. Uh, there we go. Trudeau, how much time do I have just so I can tailor my comments to fit the time available? Okay, well, I, I didn't hear that because you're muted, Trudeau, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just start. Uh, I, I so, suggested 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll confine my comments to that. So first of all, I want to say it's a real pleasure to talk to this, uh, this group. And it's very interesting to have two psychiatrists uh, reporting uh, very different points of view. And I think that reflects the controversy uh, in the profession and in our society. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Gaines' uh, uh, basic proposition is that there's an attempt to expand MAID, and I have a totally different view. I think there is an attempt by government to narrow MAID. So where did this all start off with? It started off with the Carter case, 
Uh, and the Carter was a Carter case involved a, 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 an appeal for assisted dying, and uh, the Supreme Court uh, found by nine to zero that uh, it offended the uh, the charter rights of an individual who wanted to die. So the criminal code had to be uh, uh, changed. It was it was not a social bill or a health bill. It was a criminal code bill. So the question was, did Carter cover people who had psychiatric illness? Now, this was answered very directly in a case called EF, which Mr. Uh, Dr. Gay uh, referenced. Before C-14, a person uh, seeking assisted death had to appeal to the court. EF was a woman with a conversion disorder, a psychiatric condition, unusual psychiatric condition, and she appealed to the court of Queen's Bench in Alberta, and Madam Justice Bast uh, uh, agreed that she would be covered by assisted dying based just on a psychiatric illness of conversion disorder. Uh, the Attorney General of Canada, BC and Alberta appealed this, and the appeal court uh, had a three panel uh, a, a group of judges, and they upheld the uh, the reasoning for granting a, per, a person assisted dying based just on a psychiatric diagnosis. In fact, I'll just read you from the, uh, from the uh, judgment. The issues before the court were, does the constitutional exemption granted in Carter apply only to applicants whose medical conditions are terminal? And two, are those persons suffering psychiatric conditions who otherwise comply with the criteria in Carter similarly excluded from the ambient ambit of constitutional exemption. And what they decided mm -hmm. was that Carter did allow for, for assisted dying for people with psychiatric illness. And they agreed that the EF with just the psychiatric condition had a grievous and irremediable uh, medical condition. So we know that Carter allowed this. So the, the next move from government was C-14. C-14 attempted to narrow that by inserting this phrase that the natural death had to be a reasonably foreseeable. Uh, no doctor that I know has ever understood what that means. Your natural death must be reasonably foreseeable. I mean, I'm, I'm likely to be dead in, in the next 30 years. Does that mean my death is reasonably foreseeable? Uh, it's very hard to say. So what happened uh, after C-14 came in? Well, it really uh, uh, tended to limit the number of individuals who could have assisted dying for psychiatric illness. The only people that I'm aware of, and these are very small numbers, had uh, um, uh, severe eating disorders and their deaths could be predicted to be uh, uh, reasonable. The next legal case that came in was a, a case called AB in Ontario. And in this case, Justice uh, uh, Perel uh, uh, had to deal with a woman who was 77, her only uh, diagnosis was uh, uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, so uh, what, what was decided there was that the natural death need not be connected to a specific disease or condition, but rather is connected to all of the person's mental uh, circumstances. So this, again, the courts broadened uh, the scope of assisted dying, not just focusing on the diagnosis of osteoarthritis, which is obviously not terminal, but looking at the entire, uh, entire person. Uh, the next case that came up uh, uh, was uh, uh, the, the case that Dr. Gade mentioned, the, uh, the, the Truchon case. Um, Mr. Truchon was a, a man who was uh, almost totally disabled, except he had the use of his left hand. Uh, uh, due to medical circumstances, he lost the ability to do that, and he challenged the law because his natural death was not reasonably foreseeable. He was going to be stuck in a wheelchair, unable to do anything for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, Madam uh, Justice Baudouin struck down the phrase, natural death must be reasonably foreseeable, thereby again the courts had broadened uh, the, uh, the criteria for assisted dying. So what did the government do? They came in with the C7, which again attempted uh, to narrow the rules by the, the language from, uh, uh, from the C7. A mental illness is not considered to be an illness, disease, or disability. It begs the question about what is mental illness if it's not an illness, disease, or disability. Uh, to my way of thinking, this is a, a uh, very much offends 
uh, section 15 of the charter, but then that's going to have to be adjudicated by the courts. We're going to have to have another case uh, to look at uh, uh, whether this offends the courts or not. The issue of irremediability is hotly debated in psychiatry. My view is that there are some people who have an irremediable psychiatric illness. I have seen, I would say, um, uh, um, 10 or 15 people in my practice career who meet that criteria. We know the courts in EF have agreed that that uh, is the case for, for certain uh, conditions. Not everyone, but we need to have criteria how to determine whether a psychiatric illness is uh, irremediable or not. So um, my, my uh, summary is this. Um, I don't believe that we are seeing an expansion of MAID. I think we are seeing uh, the courts expanding MAID from the Carter decision. And we're seeing a concerted effort by the politicians to narrow the conditions for MAID. Um, um, now, I want to again put my, my comments in context. I am an advocate for MAID. Um, clearly, I have, uh, I've been on two organizations who are promoting this. So uh, I do not necessarily represent the bulk of, uh, uh, of uh, opinion, but there are, uh, I would say in the psychiatrists that I know, about half of them are in favor of uh, assisted dying for people with psychiatric illness and half are opposed. Uh, I'm really quite disinterested in that. What I'm mostly interested in is what the courts have to say, because it's from the courts that we really get the essence of what we are supposed to be doing. The politicians make the laws. Uh, uh, doctors can inform politicians. Uh, they ultimately get before the courts. Uh, uh, doctors and psychiatrists can testify before the courts, but it is judges who are going to decide for us what the laws are going to be and how we're going to implement them. So uh, I'm going to finish there and uh, uh, look forward to the debate from the other participants. So thanks for listening to my comments. And again, thanks for the presentation from, from Dr. Gate. And thank you to you, Trudeau, for inviting me to this, uh, to this event. Okay, so thank you, uh, Drs. Gaines and Smith, for um, uh, putting forward uh, some some thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, people who have been attending the seminar series before know, uh, I start with uh, some questions from students. So, so there are some students who take the seminar series as a course. Uh, people who have other questions can already also certainly in the chat box type out questions and and later put on their hand. But I'll start with three, maybe four questions from the students. And then we'll uh, turn turn to the general audience, and then I may come back to some of the other students. So um, the students also send these questions before, just to clarify to Drs. Gain and uh, Smith how it works. Students send these questions before so that I that I can pick out some to stimulate uh, participant participation by our students. So I will start with um, a question by um, Marie Marie Fiedler. Uh, if Marie wants to uh, ask her question, if you prefer, if you feel that your answer, your question has been answered, you can skip. But uh, but I think Marie will, could be uh, uh, asked a third question. Hey, I could ask my question. Um, so, in preparation for this seminar, uh, we read a a paper that Dr. Gain wrote called "What Does Irremedi Irremediability in Mental Illness Mean." And in that article, you mentioned a study showing that the existence of MAID gave a number of individuals, you know, the peace of mind to keep living. I wanted to know to what extent um, both of you who spoke think that the existence of MAID inspires the opposite in individuals. So given that our healthcare system is is just wholly deficient and inequitable in providing mental health care and palliative care. Um, do you consider made to be a coercive pressure on individuals who are ill? And how do you suggest we guard against that? So Dr. Gaind, if you could start, and uh, I would suggest uh, to keep the answers and both the questions quite short. So this was a, this was a short question. So Dr. Gain. And Dr. Smith also, if Dr. Smith wants to say something afterwards. Okay. All right. Well, and thank you for the question. I think actually in many ways it gets to the heart of the matter because it weighs things of rights and what question are we asking people when they make this potential decision? It is a different decision for a marginalized person suffering from poverty and loneliness and racism and ageism than it is for a privileged person like me 
or any of us on the call. And that is why the issue of, I mean, I actually view this issue of autonomy as a very, um, it, it's an example of a colonial idea of privileged autonomy, because it's not the same decision for everyone. And I do think some people will benefit from increased autonomy for, for it. But I also think there's a separate population that evidence shows. And we actually have, as I said, look at that Canada Land podcast from this uh, Monday, and it'll answer your question from the people's own voices who are literally saying they've never had a chance to live with dignity, but now they're being provided a way to ease their suffering through an easier death. And they're thinking about it. Dr. Smith, do you want to briefly comment yes, as I'd well? Yes, I'd like to make a, a comment on that. There is no evidence uh, ever brought before parliament or before the courts that people who are disabled, people who are marginalized or otherwise disadvantaged have been forced or a, a welcome uh, made as a solution to their problems. In fact, if you look at the demographics of the people who actually have made, they are mostly white people. They are extremely well educated. They are well off financially. So the people who are actually uh, uh, taking advantage of made are not marginalized groups at all. The marginalized groups, if anything, you could argue are being uh, excluded from made for a number of different reasons. I will invite uh, Safa Bajwa to, uh, to uh, ask a question. Hi, um, so I just had a question um, it, in the paper uh, that Marie mentioned as well. It, it suggested that um, if they determine that mental illness can be deemed, um, the issue with mental illness being deemed irremediable is that if the determination is made by an assessor, it's particularly dangerous as made would be provided for an individual only on the basis of subjective evaluation of this assessor. But if an individual had another condition, um, would they then not also be evaluated by an individual assessor? And what kind of determination would provide enough certainty to allow individuals with mental illness to access made? Did Dr. You Gaines, yeah. take an initial step? Okay, thanks. So, you know, again, this is one of the issues where there's often, and it's understandable, but there is often a false conflation or a false equivalence between the unpredictability of mental illnesses and, oh, anything in life can be unpredictable, including maybe miracle cures will occur or new treatments. It is very, very different when we're talking about the degree of unpredictability of mental illnesses and their course versus predictability of illnesses that are degenerative, that we understand the biology of much better. We don't even understand the biology of any of our major mental illnesses. And that might contribute to one of the reasons we can't predict them, but there are probably others as well. To give you an example, you know, I'm, my background clinically is psycho-oncology, meaning cancer. There is no comparison between the predictability of cancers, neurodegenerative diseases, et cetera, and mental illness for, for untreated depression, naturalistic studies of untreated depression. So we're not even talking about someone taking treatment they don't want. This is spontaneous remission I'm talking about. If you go three, six to 12 months, most people with depression, clinical depression will actually remit. And the numbers increase the longer you go. If you look at cancer, the rates of spontaneous remission of advanced cancer is almost unheard of. It's less than one in a hundred thousand. It might be one in a million. We don't even know it's so small. So there is a world of difference. And that's what concerns me when my individual colleagues think that they themselves can make these predictions when science shows us that they cannot. Dr. Smith, if you want to comment any on this. Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Gade that part of the problem with psychiatry is that we do not have biological markers and that confounds many of our diagnoses, treatments and ability to predict the future. However, it's my view that if a person has been suffering from serious major depression for 30 years, I cannot see that we can argue that their condition is not irremediable. Um, we're not talking here about uh, people who have a an adjustment disorder for one to two years or depression that lasts for three to four years. Someone who's been seriously depressed for 30 years is irremediable. 
The courts have already looked at this in EF. They decided after nine years of conversion disorder, her condition was irremediable. So um, the other confounding uh, issue that, is, that hasn't been discussed yet is, you know, this is the, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Bible of Psychiatrists. In there is dementia. Dementia is a psychiatric illness. No one's arguing that dementia is, uh, is, it can be remediated. It cannot. Uh, so I think there are many areas of debate, uh, uh, and I'm of the view that there are certain conditions, not many, but certain conditions uh, that go on for many years that are definitely irremediable. Okay, uh, I will take one more, more question from a student, and I, I see that there are some questions appearing also in the chat box. Uh, James uh, Butler? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, thanks so much for this talk and all the commentary. It's been totally amazing. Um, I was wondering about kind of the uh, ground for medical and dying coming out of like the law and philosophy and sort of this um, portrait of like autonomy and freedom um, kind of uh, juxtaposed with, I think there's overlapping area, but juxtaposed with medical and dying as like a form of healthcare, and I'm wondering if kind of the tension between um, uh, your approaches and the um, like different ways of engaging with the problem kind of rest on that distinction. And if the distinction should like be made more clearly um, as to like what's um, medical system dying coming out of uh, this commitment to autonomy versus like as uh, like part of what it means to offer comprehensive health care. Um, yeah. Yep, it's very good. So Dr. Gain. So it's a very uh, sophisticated question. I think you actually have struck on one of the things that leads to the tensions between the different viewpoints. Um, you know, what we had termed that in CCA and other work is the idea, it, it links a bit to the idea of over-inclusion or under-inclusion, meaning that are there some people that we think, so, so it's not a debate about is made good or bad, it's about who will it apply to, how will it impact different populations and different groups. And so over-inclusion would be some people being able to get made that we think probably shouldn't. Under-inclusion would be some who might be restricted from getting made, who we think probably should. And, you know, I used to end my talks with this kind of precarious balance slide like this. I don't do that anymore because I no longer think that balance can be found. It is going to be in one direction or the other. And we need to decide which mistakes we want to make. And that's where I am coming at this from. And this is why I see it almost as a social contract that my rights for something, they extend so far, but when they impact someone else, then sometimes they're moderated. We're seeing that with the COVID stuff play out on a mass scale. This is actually not that different because I would love to have more autonomy to fully die on my own terms. I firmly know, and the evidence shows, that that will also mean that me and many of my cohort will die on our own terms, along the lines of autonomy you're saying, but, the price will be high. There will be marginalized people who also seek and get made. There is, that, that is unequivocal. So which mistakes do we want to make? Okay. Um, Dr. Smith, do you want to comment or do I take a next yes, question? Yes, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Even marginalized people should have autonomy. Uh, marginalized people are no less competent than anyone else to make informed decisions. To me, this whole issue is about autonomy. So I, I'm, I, I think this is a great question. I personally got interested in this issue going back to the case of Sue Rodriguez, who went before the Supreme Court in the 1990s and the Supreme Court denied her uh, um, assisted dying by, a, by a, a very slim margin, five to four. Um, the reason they did that was because they didn't know what they didn't know what to do. The, the justices were questioning that. But Sue Rodriguez made a plea: "If I don't own my life, who does?" So to me, uh, assisted dying is about uh, uh, human autonomy. It's a human right. It's a charter right. Uh, so I'm prepared to let uh, to let uh, informed, competent uh, uh, adults uh, have the uh, the 
most of the say in whether they have uh, whether they wish to assist uh, have an assisted death when they are suffering uh, irremediable uh, medical conditions, including psychiatric illness. Okay, I will uh, take another question, which is actually related to this, but start also um, by, by taking the privilege as a, as a chair to, uh, to ask a question. One of the things that we see here in the, in the discussion seems to be indeed um, a discussion that on the one hand is based on invoking rights, which is more Dr. Smith's take, and um, on the other hand, Dr. Gaint, who is more making arguments on the basis of, um, of uh, psychiatric practice and, and, and what he uh, puts forward as, as medical evidence. I mean, not complete, it's not completely separate, but that seems to be uh, a, a particular uh, characteristics of, of the discussion. And so I'm, I'm interested from, uh, from your perspective, though, both Dr. Gaint and Dr. Smith to comment on that but I will connect it to another question which I saw in the chat box, which relates to this. Uh, and uh, I will read the question simply to, uh, to save time. But I see that Gary Falia Milusis um, asks, asks a question also that in that direction, which, where she says, um, Dr. Smith said, it's judges who are going to decide for us what the laws are and how they're going to apply us. As a lawyer, this troubles me since the function of the courts is to interpret the law, not create it. Dr. Gain, you seemed um, very concerned about the quality of due diligence in terms of democratic political conversation. Can you comment on Dr. Smith's emphasis on the courts and elaborate on why you put so much emphasis on the, on the legislative process? So I think my question and also James' question and this particular question relates to, is this, is this just a question of rights or are we talking about, about um, how these rights should be informed by, by visions about healthcare. So I, I'd be interested in having comments from the two of you. So, I mean, if, if I'm kicking off, I'd say that rights are an element of it, but it is also somewhat unique when you look at Canada and the idea of a right to made, right? Then the right to it as a medical procedure. Um, I know that people will talk a good talk and say, we want to deal with poverty, we want to deal with access issues, we want to deal with marginalization. But the reality is that we still have many people living in those situations. Do they have a right to those things being fixed before we offer them a right to made? I, I would suggest that that's a bit of a problem. It, it's Again, it's not the same decision that I, any of us would be faced with compared to somebody who is seeking potentially an easy death and a painless death, and one that sometimes gets a bit romanticized, frankly, um, as, as an escape from prolonged life suffering that they see no end to. And again, it comes back to some of the false assumptions and the irremediability one is key. You know, I started with that and I keep hearing that, oh, well, for an irremediable condition, someone should be able to get it. I'm going to very briefly read you, if I can, Trudeau, this is very brief case description from actually Dr. Dembo a patient of Dr. Dembo, who's a staunch advocate for made expansion to mental illness. And she wrote this piece years ago, and it wasn't about made, it was before made. It was about her internal conflict of conveying false hope to a patient or what she thought was false hope. So it's 38 year old person, schizophrenia and OCD, resistant to multiple medications and psychotherapeutic treatments, uh, serious suicide attempts, multiple ones after 10 years of severe distress. They had a patient case conference. They did all sorts of things to see how they might be able to help. They concluded attempted suicide three times after nearly 10 years of chronic severe illness and almost no likelihood that she could recover after a detailed review of the literature and discussions with the team. And the piece was about feeling uncomfortable conveying false hope. And the punchline is that after another treatment attempt, her symptoms vanished. She has now remained well for two years. She is once again engaged in academic and advocacy work, as well as with friends and family, and grateful to be alive. So the issue of autonomy, it's not true autonomy to be able to decide when I'm irremediable if no one knows it. That's not an autonomous decision. That's a guess. And we're telling people that you're going to get made for an irremediable condition, and it's simply not the case. And we will never know which mistakes we've made. Because once someone gets made for a quote unquote irremediable condition, we think it would have never remediated. 
And, and this is why I think that the clinical piece must inform the legal piece. I'm very uncomfortable with the notion that we step back as the medical experts and say, okay, legally decide what you wanna do and then we'll do it. That's not what I went into medicine for. Dr. Smith. Well, I, I'm gonna come back to uh, my point that it is really, uh, you know, politicians make the laws, but it's up to judges to interpret them. And I prefer to follow judicial lead on this rather than listen to what my medical colleagues have to say. No, I, have, I should confess, I live with a judge. So maybe that's why, I, why I'm listening so much to what judges have to say. But the other interesting thing to look at with this debate is the parallels between this and abortion. Uh, both abortion and MAID are the interactions between law and medicine. Uh, if you look at abortion, do we really think that marginalized people are being taken advantage of? Do we think that people who are disadvantaged are being forced to have abortions? I don't think so. I don't think that's the case at all. There's, uh, there's no uh, evidence that people who are marginalized are coerced into abortions or assisted dying. It is really uh, the issue of autonomy of the individual to make decisions, medical decisions that are based in their best interest and the role of, uh, of the physicians are, are simply as a, a tool to allow this to allow this to happen. Some doctors are opposed to MAID, some are opposed to abortion, <laughs> some will get involved, some won't. No, one, no doctors are forced to be involved, but there, the law is such that we are now, as doctors, allowed to participate in assisting patients if we choose to do so. Okay, so uh, I will uh, read one more question from Helen McGee, may come back to the students afterwards. Um, how do we guard against the bias of psychiatric teams influencing support for made in, in patients they deem to have poor quality of life and schizophrenia? Dr. Gaint? You know, I think by and large, as mental health professionals, we do try to convey a sense of hope as best as possible. And so it's something where I don't think anyone would go in and intentionally try to stigmatize, et cetera. I, I don't think that happens. However, we would be pretending if we thought there's not a power imbalance. As soon as a physician or nurse or a healthcare worker walks into a room and says, here, do you want to think about this? Right there, it, it provides some element of at the very least unconscious um, uh, kind of encouragement of it. That's the way I've seen this, whether it's through psychiatric treatments or patients that I've seen through cancer treatments. I'm not an oncologist, but I see the patients through psycho-oncology. So that exists. And the idea of the value of a life, is it worth living? You know, this touches on the issue of what's rational suicide, because then you could say that, okay, we as a society will say that in these situations, we agree with you that your life isn't worth living. And on the one hand, person A comes into the emergency room and says, I want made and we agree that their life isn't worth living, so we provide it. Another person comes in and says, I want to kill myself and we certify them and keep them in the hospital against their will because we think that life should continue. Very challenging thing, but the idea of value of life comes into these discussions. And in <laughs> fact, one of the references I left you in terms of the reasons people choose psychiatric made in that recent paper. Uh, it's interesting that there was a range of reasons. One of the reasons that was expressed was, I wanted to get the assessment to have it turn me down so that I knew there was still some hope I could get better. They clearly had internalized a sense that people are saying you can't get better and maybe you should in their mind give up. So there's a range of reactions, but we have to be mindful of that. Dr. Smith. I would, I would agree with Dr. Gain that one of the difficulties, and I hope everyone appreciates this, this is a huge conundrum for psychiatry because Dr. Gain, myself, and our colleagues spend our lifetime trying to prevent suicide, treating psychiatric illness. So now we are in this conundrum of uh, how can we help someone achieve suicide? And uh, let's be clear, uh, um, the, the law does allow for suicide. It's either euthanasia or suicide. So this is a, a, not an easy proposition uh, to deal with. I think uh, having associated with people or advocates, I think there's universal agreement that no one, uh, I have never suggested 
made to a person, to a patient. I would never suggest abortion to a patient. However, if someone asks me about it, I will provide them with the information. Uh, I do not encourage people to pursue this. I will only assist them if they have, of their own free will want to take the step, want the information, and ultimately decide to uh, go that route. So uh, our, our job, I think, is to provide information and assistance, not to advocate or force or pressure people to take any decisions. So I'll take a question from uh, Elsie till you. So you can actually use the question that you typed in the chat box, Elsie, uh, if that's a more, a f more in connection with the discussion we're now having. Yeah, for sure. So I just wanted to ask about, um, you know, the role that, you know, marginalization and, you know, the uh, kind of a proactive right to 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 death that may or may not exist like i don't think it and you know it's in response to dr smith that's particularly fair to say that you know the right to that there is like a positive human right to death but regardless i i my question is um you know if there is a circumstance where which is very frequent where there's an individual who has you know a chronic illness or a disability and is also dealing with mental illness like do you, how do you feel about the situation where you know in circumstances where made is being evaluated that that individuals you know real struggle with mental health that may be impacting their decision may be overlooked in favor of the judgments that you know say that because of their chronic illness or their disability that they're in a good position to be receiving MAID. Dr. Gain. Thank you. I think I think I'll answer it in two different ways. And one is that it gets because the issue of how do we deal with that, it is very hard to separate suffering. And, and we don't separate suffering. We actually respond to total life suffering. There is a concept in palliative medicine going back decades from uh, Dame Cicely Saunders called total pain. And what it means is that when I have pain or suffering from my broken leg, that's not really separate from the suffering from my depression or from my marital breakup or from my poverty. It's all cumulative. And so in one sense, it is impossible to extricate the suffering for different reasons. This is why actually the reasonably foreseeable death, vague as it may have been, it actually did say something. It said that at least this is someone who is in a situation where they're on a course to death. And they may have other suffering, but there is ongoing deterioration, decline leading to death. The other point I'll make in terms of the issue of death from the comments that she had said about the right to death and things like that, we do have to keep in mind that the easier we make something, more people do it, including suicide. You know, it's very hard to see changes in suicide rates across populations, and sometimes you find them. Uh, you can see, and I'm not just talking about suicide prevention measures, I'm going to go back further. Uh, one of the remarkable times we saw dramatic drops in male and female suicide rates was in the UK, when they changed what they piped into the homes. So people used to kill themselves using uh, coal gas in their own homes. And when it was made less accessible because carbon monoxide was taken out, and so it wasn't as lethal, suicide rates went down. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that these people somehow simply resolved their ambivalence. It means they didn't act in a period of ambivalence when we made something easier. And you see the same thing in countries in Asia when the endosulfan ban occurred in pesticides. That was the most, it still is actually the most common way of people to kill themselves in some countries. But once again, in several countries on a national scale, you saw dramatic declines in suicide rates simply because it was harder to end your life. And so the idea of a right to death and making it easy and painless, it absolutely has implications, especially for people who are struggling with life suffering. That is very tough to withstand. And now we're presenting them an easy and painless death. Just Smith, very briefly. I, I, I feel compelled to make a plug here for another organization I'm associated with. And that is, uh, yes, the British got rid of poisonous gas we have an opportunity to get rid of handguns. Handguns, uh, the availability of handguns leads to suicide and we should, should do something uh, uh, about that. Uh, uh, and we have the, uh, politicians just need a bit of goading and that would do a lot to prevent 
uh, needless uh, suicides in the, in my opinion. Very good. So I will take uh, one more question from uh, Celine Benoit, who is putting her hand up. Hi there. Um, I'm a student as well at another university in Ontario and also a registered nurse. And um, I've focused the last couple of years on medical assistance in dying. And one of the concerns that I have that I see in my community is that um, religiously based institutions are often the institutions that provide a bulk of the care for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And that the issue I see is that based on their um, institutional and also personal perspective on MAID, it's creating a barrier for access um, to MAID, as well as potentially an access to palliative care by reason of um, saying that they're interested in MAID, so they might not be selected for a hospice setting or a setting where they would really benefit from the available care there because they wouldn't allow for an assessment of MAID on site. And so while I really respect and value all of the comments today, I also wonder if that is a further issue that would change the stats if there was more equity and distribution among access to care that's not faith-based Okay. So I was just um, curious if you could speak to that. It's a little bit outside of the, the topic, but let, maybe a brief comment by Dr. Gain. Sorry. Um, so in terms of, you know, again, there are, I, as I said, I actually work on our MAID team. I chair our MAID team as physician chair at the hospital. And I know the value that it can provide in some circumstances. And to have, a, have limitations on access to that is problematic. I think the whole idea of institutional access versus individual access is still being played out, and I, I'm not quite sure where that will land. One point I will make is that for the first time since MAID started in Canada, last year, 2020, was the first year we saw a significant shift in where it's being provided. It had been relatively equal before in terms of hospital institutional settings and home community. Actually, it started more in hospital probably and then equalized. Last year, it actually shifted to be significantly more in the community and less in institutions. And so I think one of the things we'll probably find is that as there are more robust community mechanisms for assessment and made practice, that may also change some of the access issues because it won't be dependent solely on um, you know, uh, institutions. This is, this is a huge problem in British Columbia. Uh, I've been involved with several cases where patients have had to be transferred from St. Paul's Hospital, a Catholic facility, to Vancouver General uh, just to have an assisted death. And this has been a very unpleasant way to end your life for a whole bunch of different reasons. There are other communities in BC, such as Comox, where the only facility in town is a Catholic facility. My personal view is that... Uh, Public monies should not be given to uh, uh, religious-based uh, institutions unless you're prepared to provide the whole spectrum of insured medical services, of which uh, MAID and abortion are, are two of them. Well, um, I'll take a last question by, by David Baker. There are many more questions also in the chat box. I will, with, uh, with the permission of the students, share the questions also with uh, Doctors Gaines and Smith, so that they can actually respond uh, to them after it. So, uh, David Baker. Thank you, Trudeau. Um, quickly, uh, two cases uh, with which we are involved uh, relate to the uh, obligations, if you like, on society having publicly funded uh, made, as Dr. Smith has noted. Uh, first, uh, a case in Manitoba. Uh, of a gentleman who uh, paid into the Canada Pension Plan, has um, mental and other physical disorders. Um, and uh, because he receives Canada Pension disability as a result of his uh, disabilities, he was cut off social assistance, meaning he is going to be homeless and he loses uh, the health benefits he requires for his care. He is, uh, the, the issue has to do with the clawback of uh, uh, the provincial income upon receipt of the federal income, but the fact that he has sought consultation with respect to MAID and is considered suicidal are issues uh, in the case. Uh, the second case uh, I will mention is 
uh, as Dr. Smith again has mentioned, made is publicly funded. Palliative care is generally not publicly funded and in many uh, provinces uh, is not available at all or extremely limited. Uh, and uh, there are people who are uh, considering uh, MAID or uh, receiving MAID because they don't have a palliative care available. I just mentioned those as background. What I really wanted to talk about, and I think relates to the topics that have been related uh, uh, to us um, here, is, uh, is a question about uh, um, when we talk about voluntariness and capacity, voluntariness, we ask the question, can a prisoner uh, consent on a voluntary basis to uh, give blood? Uh, uh, is there, is there a, a, because of the incarceration, uh, some uh, uh, constraint upon the voluntariness? I, I want to leave that and just go to the final point that I want to ask as my question, and that is, in terms of capacity, Dr. Gain, you were talking about uh, future prediction. Um, you raise a number of issues, which I think go to the question of capacity. Um, I know that in many made situations, capacity is being assessed by people who may uh, assess capacity in the context of a broken leg or a cold, rather than uh, something which is uh, clearly non-therapeutic, and in this case, uh, uh, life ending. And I'm wondering uh, whether you feel uh, more attention needs to be paid to the question of uh, what is capacity in the context of the made decision and who should be able to assess that? Should it be uh, a GP who specializes in the provision of made, or should it be uh, someone who uh, can consider the kinds of issues you raise in terms of uh, future prediction and so on? I'd say there are two issues as that relates to capacity. One is, uh, you know, in the new 90-day pathway, you are supposed to have, I guess, the second person being an expert in the area that is um, under consideration. So hopefully, if there was a mental illness involved, you would have a mental health expert who was also involved in the assessment, because they can be very challenging capacity assessments. However, when capacity is linked to irremediability, I would say there is no link. This is precisely the point that it's not whether the patient is capable of assessing irremediability or not. I'm not capable of assessing irremediability. No one is. That is what the science shows in mental illness. And unfortunately, that is just the way it is. It's more like throwing darts at a board. And um, what my problem with that is we are telling the patient that you're getting it for an irremediable condition. They can't have capacity for knowing they're irremediable or not, because no one can know that. So, so I, I don't see capacity. That's precisely the point. Yes, a prisoner can make a decision to give blood, but my going ahead to say I'm doing this for an irremediable condition when no one can know that, that's more like me saying not that I want to buy a lottery ticket, but that I know I'm going to win the lottery. There's a difference. I can make a decision to buy a lottery ticket, not knowing if I'm going to win, I wish I could buy one knowing I would win. And that's what we're doing with patients when we're saying we know you'll be irremediable for mental illness when we don't. So Dr. Smith, very briefly. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, you already know where I stand on the issue of irremediability. I believe there are some patients with psychiatric illness, a small number who are have irremediable illness. So I'm not gonna take that any further. I, I do wanna get back to the issue that you uh, raised uh, 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 David about the palliative care. Everyone I know who is active in the assisted dying movement is strongly in favor of palliative care. We need more palliative care. Uh, people should have palliative care and if they had sufficient palliative care, assisted dying may not be necessary. But keep in mind, at the end of palliative care, everyone dies. No one gets out of palliative care alive. This is not a, this is not a curative process. And many people in palliative care will at some point say, I've had enough, it's time for me to go. And that's where uh, MAID should be an option for them as well. So Dr. Smith, would you, um, if I can, and, uh, can permit myself to interfere here, would you agree that we may have had the timing wrong that we should have introduced a right to palliative care before we go to a right to MAID, fully funded MAID? 
Uh, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think, you know, there are many, many problems with our healthcare system and uh, unavailability of, uh, of uh, care is one of them. You know, there, there are 30% of, uh, of uh, uh, patients in British Columbia who do not have a family doctor. So there are, there are thousands of problems with healthcare. Uh, we need a lot more money, a lot more leadership. Uh, palliative care is certainly one of them. Okay, so I think we're uh, close to the end of our um, time. So maybe if I could invite, we started a little bit uh, later, uh, Dr. Gaint, some last comments, and then Dr. Smith as well, if, if he wants to, or if you consider this your last comments, that's fine, but Dr. Gaint. Uh, given we're at time, I'm actually fine to just kind of thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and it was a stimulating discussion. I hope that it gave people things to think about. And, and please do look up some of the references. There's a lot of interesting information out there that people aren't necessarily aware of with some of the assumptions that our um, policy is based on. So okay. thank you. Great, great discussion. And I'm happy to carry on uh, answering questions via email if people uh, want to do that. Yes, and uh, people could certainly contact me to get uh, your email addresses, the email addresses of the speakers. Um, I will also, if the technicians are on board, ask the uh, technicians to um, safeguard uh, the comments in the chat box. I tried to do so, but I didn't manage to, uh, to copy and paste them. And um, I thank everyone for attending, for participation in the discussion and uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Smith and Gain for a very uh, stimulating discussion.